It is pretty shocking that Pokemon Black 2 and White 2 exist at all. There had never been a direct sequel to a core Pokemon game before, and there haven't been any since. They were released on the original DS more than a year and a half after the launch of the much more powerful 3DS. And to cap off this risky strategy, the set of games they were following up on were already the most controversial and least financially successful in the whole series. With Black and White 2, Game Freak doubled down. The developers insisted that yes, the new perspective on Pokemon offered by this fifth generation of games deserved further exploration, even though large portions of the fanbase were not on board. The result was, in many ways, the absolute pinnacle of 2D Pokemon. And nobody played them. Well, nobody relative to the franchise's extremely high standards, 7 million is still a lot of games sold, but for Pokemon, it's actually a low point. While not without a small group of ardent supporters, Black and White 2 are these days perceived mostly as a footnote. So now, 10 years after their release, I want to give these games their time in the sun. They have plenty of unique qualities that let them stand on their own, but I am also drawn to how they develop and complicate the ideas established in their predecessors. The specific ways they at times synergize with and at others contradict the messages of Black and White give Black and White 2 their own distinct identity. Furthermore, what we learn here can tell us a lot about both the underwhelming present of the Pokemon franchise and why its potential future may be more promising than I once believed. Welcome to Reconstructed. The first four generations of Pokemon all had what is colloquially known as a third version. This includes Pokemon Yellow, Crystal, Emerald, and Platinum. Released a year or two after the original pair of games, they would mostly recycle the same experience but with more polish and a few chunks of fresh content tacked on, serving as a sort of definitive edition for each generation. For a long time, this was a cast iron mold. Generation 5 finally broke it. Black and White 2 are explicitly set two years after the events of Black and White. Some old characters return, but have recognizably matured and settled into new roles. The player character and rival are themselves brand new, something not done by the third versions of the past. This decision to write a sequel rather than a remaster has a dramatic effect. Black and White 2 are liberated from having to do the same things, say the same things as the previous games. For the first time, a Pokemon story is allowed to grow. In order to dive into why I believe this choice was so valuable, I need to re-establish my thoughts on Black and White 1. I recommend watching my original video on them, but I intend for this video to stand on its own as well. These games take place in the region of Unova, based loosely on New York City and generally designed to represent the value of diversity. The most clear message presented by Black and White is that incorporating a diverse set of values into how you live is ideal, that everyone should always be considering new points of view. The antagonists are fighting for one exclusive vision of society in which Pokemon are separated from people, led at first by a character named N, who is shown to be completely sincere in his belief that catching and battling Pokemon is abusive. This is almost interesting, but ultimately the game undercuts itself by framing N as unequivocally wrong and refusing to change any of the gameplay to better fit the plot. The story and systems of play clash. Battling with Pokemon is the only method of progression which prematurely answers the moral questions the writing pretends to raise. This paired with the reveal that the true villain was a manipulative liar named Getsis who only seeks world domination ends up communicating, to my ear, the systems we already have are perfectly fine and do not need to change. While I find this conclusion sour, it is still admirable to be ambitious and experimental in creating a Pokemon story, something that had never really been done before. It is better to bite off more than you can chew, than not bite at all. A sequel is then a much needed chance to reflect and develop those ideas. Black and White 2 does not take that opportunity lightly. It is satisfying and pleasantly surprising how much self-awareness the games express regarding Black and White's shortcomings while at the same time not being overly dependent on their successes. They definitely smooth out the rougher edges that alienated some players in the first games. Pokemon from previous generations are this time mixed in with the new creatures here and there. 
the confusing, somber intro movie is replaced with a more conventional one. These changes do reduce the distinctiveness of the Gen 5 experience, and I personally always saw those features in a positive light, but as we'll see, the choice to make the games a little lighter and more approachable does not condemn them to being any less interesting. Another common complaint about Black and White was the strict linearity of its world design. You just go around in a semicircle like this. In contrast, the path the player takes through Black and White 2 zigzags unpredictably, slingshotting you from corner to corner in a way that was clearly designed to differentiate itself from the first games as much as possible. Even though you are nominally in the same region, Unova, of the 12 cities you visit in the main story, only 5 of them are shared with that of Black and White 1, and another 5 are entirely new. This creates an experience with the world of the game that has as different a personality as you could realistically imagine while still sharing the same map. And even the old locations have changed substantially over those two years. If the theme of the region in Black and White was diversity, in Black and White 2 it is growth. Everywhere you revisit has flourished in your absence. The gym leaders all have fresh new puzzle designs for their gyms. Nimbasa City has an expanded amusement park. Mistralton City has a bigger airport that now takes passengers. Undella Town now hosts a huge underwater tunnel connecting it to the new tourist destination of Humalau City. Castilia City has, depending on the version, either extended its construction north or excavated and refurbished some ruins and, best of all, now allows access to its sewers. The most striking evolution, though, is that of Driftvale City. What was two years ago a modest, ambiguously working-class town is now lined with sparkling hotels, host to the prestigious Pokemon World Tournament. The Emerald Mine run by Clay, the city's gym leader, has become massively successful, driving an economic boom. And this is the idealized, all-too-rare version of economic growth where the profits are actually shared among the population rather than being hoarded at the top. Overall, Unova has grown into an even better place to live. It has become further interconnected, stuffed with even more opportunities for business and leisure. Much of the NPC dialogue credits the flourishing of the region to collaboration with Pokemon, driving home the idea established in the first games that both people and Pokemon are better off living together. So the region has changed significantly in a way that matches the themes. How much has the gameplay changed? Well, not much. This is still your old school Pokemon at its core. Catching and battling Pokemon is the only way to progress through the game. My biggest critique of Black and White 1 was that the inflexibility of the game's systems was incompatible with the storyline. Black and White 2 do not add any flexibility. There is no overhaul to the combat, no opportunity to actually prove that you treat your Pokemon as friends and partners rather than tools. So that problem still generally applies to the sequels, but it does feel less jagged this time around for a few reasons. First of all, the actual experience of playing the game hour to hour is designed to encourage an emotional, empathetic connection with your Pokemon. While the game still expects us to take it on faith that battling is not abusive without really showing us why, most of what you do outside of the battles is for your Pokemon. The player is constantly making sure they're as healthy as possible and feeding them little treats that strengthen their abilities. There is plenty of optional side content which basically amounts to just playing with your pets, like the musicals in Embossa City or the new Pokestar Studios where you can act with your Pokemon in miniature movies. Participation in such activities is never required, but plenty of players, especially children, will engage with them to some extent. This is something I didn't give Black and White enough credit for, something that has been consistent across the series. Most people don't play these games because the battles are just so fun and engaging, they play them because they like the cute little monsters. That's the primary appeal. So yes, the game makes it very difficult to actually mistreat your Pokemon according to its systems, but there is a lot in place to guide the player toward treating them with care and empathy regardless. Even as an adult, it makes me genuinely sad to delete the save data of any Pokemon game. My friends are in there. Furthermore, Black and White 2's story is a little more careful with how it presents its ideas. There is no one like N and Getsis advocating right from the start for something that is transparently impossible within the game. Team Plasma is still around, but have mostly dropped the pretenses of Pokemon Liberation and just outright say they want world domination. There is still moral ambiguity and complexity in its conflict, but it comes later and it comes subtler. The game's writing is more cognizant of building a plot that meshes better with the gameplay systems already in place. This does have the effect of sacrificing memorability for the sake of cohesiveness, though. There is no character in the sequels with as much gravity as N had in the originals. 
They do succeed in avoiding as muddled a message as Black and White 1, but at the cost of a reduction in ambition. After all, the systems still cannot change. At least, not yet. Black and White 2 took advantage of their status as sequels successfully enough that I wish it was the standard for the franchise. The region of Unova is deepened effectively. The broader themes of the fifth generation are elaborated on rather than just being repeated. The chance for hindsight lent Black and White 2 a heightened self-awareness that, as we'll explore later, serves the story well. Both sets of games function competently as independent experiences, but taken together they certainly feel more like two parts of a greater whole. Perhaps the best example of this is the sequel's most important character, someone who is entirely new and yet defined largely by his relationship to the events of the originals. This is Hugh. He is the obligatory rival to the player character in Black and White 2. At first, he seems to fit the category of edgy rival, similar to Silver in the Generation 2 games. And he does have some edge to him, for sure. He glowers, he is curt and quick-tempered. However, none of this animosity is directed at the player themselves. In fact, rival is not a very accurate label for how he and the main character interact. They have very different motivations striving toward very different goals. Their relationship is defined much more by working together and supporting each other than by competing. Hugh isn't becoming a trainer to see more of the world or become the champion of the Pokemon League. He is certainly in a rush to get stronger, but for a while it's unclear why. Soon though, his aggressive reaction toward Team Plasma and the idea of Pokemon going missing start to clue us in. Eventually, he explains what drives him. Five years ago, Team Plasma stole my little sister's purloin. It had been given to her as a present. I was only a little kid. I couldn't do anything. So... So that's why I have to get stronger." Much of the first half of the game's adventure is outlined by following Hugh as he chases low-ranking Plasma members around the various cities. Team Plasma at this point are themselves not very interesting. Their reputation ruined by the failed takeover of Unova two years ago, they have mostly resorted to being petty thieves and no longer have a coherent mission statement. But they are planning something, and Hugh is single-mindedly committed to stopping them and rescuing his sister's stolen Pokémon. This becomes more complicated in Driftvale City, where Hugh and the player stumble on a small community of reformed, former Team Plasma members. These people no longer want to be associated with Plasma's current actions and are trying to atone for their crimes by finding homes for lost Pokémon. This presents an interesting dilemma for Hugh, who refuses to accept that these people may have actually changed. Five years ago, Team Plasma, I mean you, stole my little sister's Pokémon. I'm the pathetic trainer who wasn't able to stop you. Don't think I'll ever forgive you. I can never forgive Team Plasma." Hugh's vendetta against the villain team and outright refusal to forgive any of its former members not only develops his character, but also clarifies a lot about Team Plasma's impact and true nature. In the first games, every bad thing we see Plasma do is immediately resolved, and Unova seems mostly unaffected by their presence aside from a handful of isolated incidents. Here it is confirmed that yes, even though they were stopped, they really did hurt a lot of people. Hugh is forcing himself to become a strong trainer as fast as possible, grow up as fast as possible, because he blames himself for what happened even though he was a very young child at the time. He is clearly traumatized. Team Plasma's actions have had a long-lasting and profound negative effect on the citizens and communities of Unova, and a lot of what they did hasn't been fixed. That purloin is still missing. At the same time though, we see that Team Plasma had more depth than being simple bad guys. In the first games, it mostly seemed like N was the only one who honestly believed in Pokémon Liberation. With the former Plasma group in Driftvale, we learned that a substantial number of them earnestly thought they were saving Pokémon. The antagonists of Black and White 2 are more layered than ever before, and in a way that recontextualizes their presence in the previous games. Now two things are clear that were not beforehand. Much of Team Plasma believed they were doing the right thing, and also their methods were pretty brutal and traumatized children for years. So we are left with some questions. Can these former Plasma members make up for the damage they did, and should Hugh even forgive them if they can? Across the expansive Pokémon franchise, it is rare to see long-term change like this. 
Black and White 2 take advantage of their time skip to clear up ambiguity and follow through on the arcs of returning characters. Bianca and Charon, your two rivals in the first games, appear again but with new jobs that make sense for them. By the end of Black and White, Bianca realized she was more fit to be a researcher than a trainer, and now we meet her as Professor Juniper's primary assistant. She is the one to give the player their first Pokémon, and eventually you help her with primary research into the location of legendary Pokémon that even Juniper is unaware of. Charon is now the new gym leader of the starting town. His arc in black and white was learning how to temper his personal ambition for the good of the community. He still maintains a very strong team and enters big tournaments, but his primary focus is now educating and encouraging the novice trainers of the region. Becoming a gym leader is a significant achievement, but importantly he did not accomplish his original goal of becoming the champion. For as precocious and talented as Charon was, Iris was more so. Even younger and even more of a natural, Iris was already a gym leader two years ago, and now it is she, and not Charon who presides over the Elite Four. He accepts this reality and settles into a different role, demonstrating his new maturity. He even got contacts, like a real adult. In the end, Black and White 2 utilize old characters and locations to lend a sense of depth and believability to its world, which supports the new story being told. Bianca and Charon and Iris are present, but peripheral. They function primarily to construct a sense that Unova is a place where important events occur beyond the vision of the player, which makes new characters like Hugh feel all the more real. And it is Hugh that forms the emotional core of the game. He is the character we are most invested in, the one with the clearest opportunity to grow and learn throughout the story. Exploring the rearranged Unova and learning more about Team Plasma with him as he follows his quest to rescue his sister's Pokémon is the main hook. But then, what are the villains up to this time? There is a scene in Black and White 1 that, while innocuous in isolation, in the broader context of the game bothered me quite a bit. On top of the celestial tower in the northwest corner of the region, there stands a giant bell. You are told that it possesses spiritual significance, that it can judge the true character of whoever rings it. When the player character rings this bell, they are told that they are kind and strong no matter what. This more or less confirms that everything the player does is perfectly morally justified. It is not hard to accept that N's extremist belief that people and Pokémon should be separated entirely is misguided. It is hard, at least for me, to accept that there is nothing at all wrong with these systems of battle and capture. Black and White 1 refuse to suggest that any change is necessary at all. In Black and White 2, the Celestial Bell is still there, but its importance goes unmentioned. This is fitting, because these games have thought it through more thoroughly and no longer believe that these systems are inherently without fault. Deep in the sewers below Castilia City, the player first meets Colrus, a scientist whose name is hard to pronounce and whose hair is incomprehensible. He leaves a distinct impression. What is a man as clean and well-composed as him doing down there anyway? He explains his purpose. I am a scientist. The theme of my research is bringing out the power of Pokemon. Bringing out the power of Pokemon. Is it possible to bring out their maximum power through the bond they share with their trainers? Or is there some other, different method? Soon after, he clears out the rock-type Pokemon blocking the route northward by energizing them with a strange machine. Apparently he has made real advances with his research, being able to move the stubborn Pokemon when no one else could. Colrus is generally friendly and helpful if a bit hard to parse. He is certainly not threatening. In your next encounter, he elaborates. The latent power of Pokemon. What is the best way to bring it out? If possible, I want it to be the trust between trainers and their Pokemon, just as it has always been. But trust, it's too much of an unknown factor. There is a glimmer of suspicious phrasing here, but still he seems harmless and even explicitly disagrees with Team Plasma's original goal of Pokémon liberation. Colrus fills a similar role as N did in the first games, an enigmatic character who pops up here and there with flowery language and initially nebulous goals. However, they are also opposites in a sense. N thought the connection between people and Pokémon should be severed, while Colrus believes strongly in the power of that connection. The scientist is not transgressive to the societal norms of Unova like N was, but rather thinks they should be taken further yet. 
the player does not learn that Colrus is in fact the new boss of Team Plasma until reaching the core of their headquarters. After their failed attack two years ago and N's subsequent abandonment of the team, which many of its remaining members view as a betrayal, Plasma settled on a more straightforward plan, taking Unova by force. They hired Colrus to lead this new phase, providing him all the resources he needed for his dream project of building a Pokemon-fueled superweapon. The two most powerful and historically important Pokemon in Unova are the twin dragons Reshiram and Zekrom. In the distant past, they used to be one larger being, an unnamed ultimate dragon that split apart in response to conflict between human factions. Both of them are currently absent from the region, but as it turns out, this division also created a third legendary dragon. This is Qrem, the boundary Pokemon, an ice dragon type that is described as an empty husk, the leftovers of the full dragon, yet is extremely powerful nonetheless. Qrem is the creature Plasma will use to freeze over Unova and rule it with an iron fist. Qrem is how Colrus will fulfill his dream of maximizing the power of Pokemon. When you finally confront the scientist on Plasma's flying fortress, he expresses no remorse. What I desire is to bring out the entirety in Pokemon potential. If I can accomplish that, I don't care what it takes. If it means the strength must be brought out by the interactions between Pokemon and trainers, then so be it. If it means you have to use a merciless approach, like Team Plasma's, and force out all of the Pokémon's power, then so be it. And yes, if the entire world is destroyed as a result, then so be it. Despite Plasma's insistence that Qrem is an unfeeling weapon, it is obviously miserable, obviously just as much a victim here as the people in the cities it freezes. It is kept in a tiny container hooked up to machines with tubes and wires. When you approach, it cries out. Hugh notes that it sounds lonely. Qrem is hurting. As a villain, Colrus represents something new, the status quo taken too far. He is not an absurd megalomaniac like Getsis, nor is he naive and brainwashed like N. Instead, he is a respected scientist, successful and integrated within normal society. Colrus knows how the world works, and still he chose to do this. This is, finally, a tangible example of the kind of trainers N despised, abusive and lacking empathy, that were entirely invisible in Black and White 1 beyond the obvious cruelty of Getsis. They are visible now. The morality of the previous games was, forgive me, very Black and White. Now we are shown shades of grey. With Colrus and Kyurem, Black and White 2 show that there is a wrong way to work with Pokemon. The systems can be corrupted. So how can we improve them? The climax of Black and White 2's story begins when Team Plasma uses Qrem's power to cover Opelucid City in unbreakable ice. This location was targeted because its gym leader possessed a strange item called the DNA Splicers. In the chaos, the Splicers are stolen and Plasma retreats to a landmark named Giant Chasm, Qrem's original home, to prepare for the final phase of their plan. With the invaluable help of the ex-Team Plasma members, the player and Hugh manage to successfully infiltrate the frigate that serves as their headquarters. After defeating approximately 1 million Plasma Grunts, you take down their leaders as well, including Colrus and the Shadow Triad. This section includes Hugh finally accepting the help of the former Plasma members, learning to believe that people can actually change for the better. He also, at long last, is reunited with his sister's stolen Pokémon. However, the true mastermind of Team Plasma finally emerges from the shadows even more unhinged than before and wearing an even cooler looking cloak. Getsis is back. He takes Kyurem into the depths of the giant chasm where its power will be strongest. When you chase down and confront him, he commands Kyurem to execute the player character, a child where they stand. At the final second, you are saved by N and one of the legendary dragons from the first games. However, this too was part of Getsis' plan. He uses the DNA splicers to initiate a fusion process between Qrem and N's partner dragon that looks, more than anything else, deeply painful.
Of course, though, this is not enough. Getsis only views his Pokémon as tools and thus is unable to draw out their true potential. The player defeats both the fused Qrem and Getsis himself, and the crisis is averted. N thanks you for saving his partner and delivers a speech explaining what he learned in his travels during the time skip. On that day two years ago, a certain trainer taught me something. By accepting different ideas, this world creates a different chemical reaction. So I met many different Pokémon and people and heard so much. And that's how my world quietly grew bigger. By being with Pokémon, humans can continue toward new horizons. By being with humans, Pokémon can exhibit their true power. That's what the legendary dragon taught me. The ideal for Pokémon and me. And someday, both ideals and truth will come together. Then, Pokémon and humans will be freed from the oppression of Pokéballs. It's nice to see that N has grown into a more nuanced understanding of the world than his previous all-or-nothing approach. But also... Ah... Uh, hmm... The oppression of Pokéballs? Throughout the game, the existence and importance of Pokéballs is discussed here and there, sometimes with vague questions about the ethics of using them. This is infrequent and easy to miss, but certainly present. Despite their ubiquity, this is not common within the series. Pokéballs are always used constantly, their imagery plastered everywhere, but they are never analyzed. Even the liberation-obsessed Team Plasma from Black and White 1 never centered Pokéballs specifically as a problem like this. Let's rewind a bit. The moment where Hugh fulfills his goal and reunites with his sisters Purloin does not go at all like he had always planned. It was in the possession of one of the Shadow Triad, an elite group of Plasma operatives. They return the Pokémon to Hugh freely, but something is wrong. It has evolved into a Liopard and growls at the boy. Hugh does not recognize it at all and yells that it must be someone else's Pokémon. It isn't. The Shadow explains, Now it only listens to my commands. Such is the fate of Pokémon that are trapped in Pokéballs. Ah, uh, I feel sorry for Pokémon. Lord Getsis spoke of Pokémon liberation years ago simply for his own ambitions. But if his plans had succeeded, many Pokémon would have been saved. This Liopard, well, you knew it as a purloin, if it had been released, it might have returned to you. After this encounter, Hugh is frozen. He and the player had been fighting side by side until this point, but this situation is so upsetting to the rival that you have to continue without him. Clearly he had envisioned some sort of smooth, happy moment of reunion. The reality is much harsher. And Black and White 2 does something bold here, something dangerous. It implies that Plasma's victory would have saved Hugh this pain. For all the bad things they did, for as much of a disaster as their takeover would have been, in this specific case, it would have been good. Because the player defeated N in the first games, because the system of Pokéball capture was left intact, Hugh and his sister remained traumatized for much longer. Shortly before Hugh meets the Shadow Triad, there is a small moment that sticks out sharply, but only if you're reading the flavor text more carefully than Pokémon games typically demand. One of the countless low-ranking Plasma members opens the battle by saying she has a Pokémon that was stolen from a child. She sends out a Liopard. The battle is over as quickly as it starts, in my case my Swanna took it out in one hit. This encounter is one of many just like it. There is nothing to alert you that this Liopard might be special unless you are paying close attention to the text boxes which usually contain no information of note. Was this the same Liopard that Hugh was searching for? Perhaps the Shadow Triad distribute their Pokémon among the grunts. Or maybe it wasn't. Maybe this same story has happened countless times. What this brief moment communicates is that all of the dozens and dozens of Plasma's Pokémon that you have dispatched and immediately forgotten had their own tragic backstory. And it is Pokéballs that allowed them to cause this suffering. Here we see that Team Plasma are not the unique independent actors they were once presented as. In reality, they are just as much a part of the systems of society, created by those systems, as anything else. They, and by extension all the villainous teams across the franchise, are only able to do what they do because of the powerfully coercive nature of Pokéballs. Getsus' signature Pokémon is Hydreigon, and it knows the move Frustration, which grows in power as the friendship value lowers. If it weren't for the oppression of Pokéballs, this Hydreigon would have abandoned Getsus long ago. Black and White 1 lacked the confidence to label any of the traditional Pokémon systems as harmful. Black and White 2 do not. Pokéballs, practically the logo of the whole series, are shown to cause real pain. 
that is a powerful choice. As we know, video games are strongest when there is synergy between the story and the gameplay. So how does Black and White 2's gameplay reflect these interesting decisions? Well, it doesn't much. You still have no option but to utilize Pokeballs all the time. I suppose one could do a protest playthrough where you only use your starter, but they don't start running this Pokeball oppression idea until over halfway through the game, and that would be a substantially less fun experience overall. One area where this feels particularly incongruous is the player's interaction with these Swords of Justice, a trio of legendary Pokémon. One by one, they approach the player directly, allowing a clear opportunity to capture them. The lore of these Pokémon specifically describes them as misanthropic, deeply distrustful of people ever since an ancient war. The fact that they choose to appear at all communicates that they understand the threat of Colrus and Kyurem to be catastrophic, and that the player character is remarkably trustworthy. You will use their powers well, they say. But I didn't. I caught each of them, as not catching any legendary feels like a wasted opportunity, but never ended up using them. I already had a strong team of six Pokémon. So my character accepted the trust of this group of noble, powerful, natural protectors, and then stuffed them into a computer indefinitely. Actually, you know what, this is bothering me. There we go, that's better. However, there is one moment where the gameplay and story align, fleeting yet resonant. Another staple of the Pokémon formula since the second generation is a climactic encounter with a legendary Pokémon, almost always the one that's on the game's cover art and start screen. It is usually up to the discretion of the player whether they defeat it in battle or go through the often lengthy process of capturing it. Until now. In your confrontation with the fused Qrem, the game does not allow you to catch it. After everything you have learned, it is clear both thematically and mechanically, using a Pokeball here would be wrong. This is a systemic denial of the expectations of Pokemon in a way that has chemistry with the story it is telling. It's not much, but it is real. Of course though, this cannot last. Not this time. Once you clear the Elite Four and enter the Hall of Fame, you have the ability to seek out and catch Reshiram or Zekrom, and then return to the giant chasm to catch Qrem. You can even fuse them back and forth with the DNA splicers. After all, if you could never possess the Pokémon on the game's box, it would be frustrating to most players bordering on false advertising. Locking a Pokémon out of being captured entirely is unthinkable, at least for now. When the player catches either Reshiram or Zekrom, N is present. He says goodbye to his longtime partner Pokémon and leaves you with this message. Someday, Pokémon and humans will be bound together without Pokéballs. They will simply trust and help one another. Make that kind of world. In the post-game, our main characters are taking steps, small but tangible, toward that better world. Hugh has a redirected focus as a trainer, prioritizing strengthening the bond with his partners over revenge. He spends his free time helping ex-Plasma members reunite lost Pokémon and working towards befriending his sister's Lyopard. Colrus has voluntarily disbanded Team Plasma and feels proven wrong by his loss to the player. His change of perspective seems driven more by utility than ethics, but at the very least, your actions have made him less likely to exploit Pokémon in the future. Pokémon Black 2 and White 2's message is both an extension of, and refutation of, the message of Pokémon Black and White. They still believe that the general shape of society is good. People and Pokémon should live together. This time, though, they show that striving for systemic change is not always naive. The systems do cause real harm and should be replaced, we just aren't ready yet. You can challenge the systems, but you must do so slowly. Someday, the world will change for the better. So then, when is someday? As is tradition, the post-game of Black and White 2 unlocks all the distant corners of the map that were previously inaccessible. This includes the southeast region of Unova, where the starting town from Black and White 1 was located. There you can meet the mother of the protagonist character from the first games. At first glance, she actually mistakes you for her child before apologizing and explaining that they left Unova on the back of the other legendary dragon in the hope of reuniting with N. It is a bit odd, right? This old character is mentioned frequently with an air of reverence, but never reappears to help in the crucial moments. One of the last things N says in the post-game is that he plans to leave Unova in search of that trainer. They have been looking for each other the whole time, and we never see their reunion. 
On the whole, despite all my problems with them, I view the fifth generation of Pokemon as a triumph. They took a stagnating franchise and breathed new life into it, trying new things in a way that was often clumsy, but always honest. While, yes, little of the core Pokemon blueprint was altered, they managed to change about as much as they realistically could within that strict framework. And the specific evolutions present in Black and White 2 demonstrate a promising degree of self-awareness. Not only did they take full advantage of being a chronological sequel, they are just supremely polished games, and there are plenty of stellar creative mechanics that further address the weaknesses of their predecessors that didn't fit into this script. The fact that this is the mainline Pokemon game that the fewest people played is genuinely sad. Black and White 2 show that people can change and show why growth is necessary. They follow a set of games that were black and white to a fault and introduce shades of grey. They serve as both a warning and a promise. We must move on from the way things are. As it turned out, the fanbase at large wasn't quite ready for all this. Even though the changes were moderate, they were still too big for many. A lot of my earliest heated arguments on the internet were defending these games from the infuriating reactionaries of r slash Pokemon. I saw the promise then. I still do now. To some degree, this is reflected in the story of Black and White 2 themselves. Massive change is necessary eventually, but we aren't ready. The promise is yet unfulfilled. When discussing Black and White 1 in isolation, I ended on a pessimistic note. It felt hard at the time to imagine a strong future for Pokemon considering the public rejection of Generation 5 and the immense pressure created by the size of its media empire. In the year since my first video, though, something important happened. Pokemon Legends Arceus was released, and it was good. I haven't played it myself yet, but a lot of people who hated Sword and Shield and were ready to hate this game liked it. Arceus was by far the biggest mechanical departure for a mainline Pokemon game, and it was a critical and commercial success. Hey, I think we're ready now. Black and White 2 didn't feel like the second half of a story, it felt like the second of three parts. We still have not seen Reshiram, Zekrom, and Kyurem in one place. Hey, I think someday is soon. In the next few years, it should be time for the developers to make good on the promise of the fifth generation, to replace the systems and reinvent our relationship with Pokemon. They better remember that promise. Hey, Game Freak. Show us the full dragon. Did you know that there is another bell you can ring to prove you're a good person? It's right there. Like and subscribe. Thank you everyone for watching. This video was supported by my wonderful patrons with a special thanks to Cass R. Supporting my Patreon will get you regular updates, early access to videos, an invite to my Discord server, and your name in the credits forever. A year ago when I made my first video on Black and White, I only had one name in the credits, and now I have this many. Uh, that's really cool. Thank you everyone. The best way to help this video thrive is to share it around on Reddit, Twitter, Discord, etc. And I would love to hear about more people's experience with these games. Pokemon playthroughs are very customized, and there are a lot of elements that I didn't discuss today, some of which I mentioned in the pinned comment below. As always, I've been Skyhoppers, and I'll see ya in the next one.